happy, what is today, Wednesday as I'm recording this? <clears throat> I've been, uh, I got a sore throat the other day. It was pretty bad yesterday. And there's a good possibility that even if other things had worked out and I would have had the time to stream, my voice, my general throat health would have prevented it. Not so today. Gotta get back on the wagon. What I have today is something that I, uh, I saw it posted, oh, I'm not sure where, but it popped up and it looked pretty darn good called The House Under the Moon Dial, and it's available on Itch for $10. There are community copies that periodically, I think, what's the deal here? I think for everybody who prints, so there's a print-on-demand version. For everyone who gets a print-on-demand version, it adds some more community copies. So there's a good chance people love to print things out. I mean, I like having physical copies and stuff, too. That some other copies will pop up. So let's take a look. Hey, Frederick. You're making a witch for your own game? Nice. So let's see what this one is. I have it over here. And I will go into full screen mode for our viewing pleasure. Okay. So this is a an OSR adventure for character levels three to four. So that's kind of a nice spot. There's lots of stuff for low-level characters, and then you know there's much less stuff. High-level characters. This is kind of a nice sweet spot. I think a lot of people look at levels like Three to seven-ish is kind of the, the sweet spot for play, whether it's OSR really or even kind of regular D&D. Though maybe it's a little bit different in, in, say, fifth edition, but I think that those kind of levels are good levels because you've kind of you've unlocked some stuff. You're a little bit hardier. You've got some interesting abilities, but maybe you haven't gone, you haven't gotten the really big powers yet, so you're still somewhat vulnerable to stuff. This is by creator Hexano, Hexanome. So name after my own heart and of course we get a wonderful hex nip let me get my glasses on because it is a little bit small print on the screen so it's really interesting the way this book is laid out here so there's some kind of almost like a, uh, a not a table of contents but like a, a key that's along the bottom in orange. So here you can see highlighted is maps and travel. So that work out. So presumably we're going to have this maps and travel. And then if I'm reading this correctly, we'll get the table of contents and background then. Or is it? I don't know. We'll have to, we'll have to see how it goes. I'm not sure if it's supposed to go first row all the way across. But I kind of, it's kind of a nice, it's a nice thing. Is there, uh, are there page numbers there too? I'm not sure. But kind of a cool, a little bit different than normal. Because sometimes I've seen those. They'll put a little tab on the on a top corner. But I like it. So we know we're in maps and travel. We have a hex map here. I like the stylized hexes. Very nice, very clear. I kind of like, God, they got this nice. I've been wanting to mess around with it, but I hadn't done it. I haven't done it yet. But I, I sort of like that they've put some a little bit of texture. leading there and i also like that they you have the surrounding hexes but it, they're sort of faded and then the hexes that were are a part of this campaign and you get a good number of them are in bold and i guess there was one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen seventeen eighteen nineteen hexes so that's a nice number so there are and so we have of those 19 hexes 13 of them well, they're all numbered. Let's see. There's encounters. Oh, I guess are we supposed to roll? No, this is hex. All right, so hex one. Let's see if I'm reading this correctly. So in hex one, we have a tarnished silver dagger that's buried under a collapsed dolmen. An emaciated talking rabbit caught in a snare. That's over here. Three. Interesting kind of number. So it looks like it starts from this corner, then kind of goes around, and then goes over one. Definitely is an interesting one, two, three, four, five. Huh. And I guess some of them don't have numbers because I guess they're special locations. Okay. So we get stuff like, uh, you know, in, the, in these hexes. I see. So the, uh, okay. I probably should have read the headers of the table. So in the numbered hexes, and they're not all numbered, which is a bow is not numbered. Romage, which maybe is the starting town, maybe not. I don't know. Moondial, Black Pond, and Saints Saints Tomb, and Ship in the Tree. These are all 
I'm guessing special locations, they do not have that. In the numbered hexes, which I guess is all of them. Yeah, so there, because I think there was 13 and then 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Right, so all the numbered hexes have some kind of point of interest in which there's a two in six chance of being found, of course, just as needed. And like we talked about, there's a talking rabbit, a caught in the snare, the silver dagger, a weeping willow, a skeleton that clings to a trapped strong box with some pretty valuable pearls in there. We have a majestic oak with some initials scratched in it. And there's a treant there. There's a pseudo dragon. What's the A? We have a little note there. Not sure what the A means, but maybe it shows up somewhere. And some other stuff. That's cool. And then we get to some. So now we have encounters in the woods. So we're supposed to roll every watch. So I don't know if we know how long. I don't know if they're giving us a. And this, I guess, is a question. In a, in a case where. I guess what I don't know. I don't know what OSC, if OSC has a def, defined watch. And this is just cold, cold water for the working man. I don't know if uh, OSC has a watch defined. I kind of like to know. If we're using a term like watch, and I'm not sure if it's defined, I personally kind of like to know what, how many hours that is because if I'm using a different system, because, for example, for me, I kind of like three-hour. I think a lot of people go with four-hour travel segments or over over land, whatever, day segments. I like three hours, but it's not a big deal. But I'd like to know, do they mean every four hours or every three hours? What is the watch in this case for them, I guess? But in any case, whatever your watch is, or I guess you could just treat it as whatever your watch is, roll every one. So we could get wolves, boars, the D20, and there's uh, about a 50, looks like it's a 50% chance of an encounter more or less. Basically, distant church bells is kind of nice, but it's not an encounter, and then there's no encounter. And there's some interesting things here. Wolves, boars, elk, black bears. Like, ooh, oh, I, oh, I, that's kind of nice. Ah, nifty. So they have, he has some icons for day and night. And he's able to just, put, instead of having different day and night charts, he's got one table and just uses those icons to set off. So, so for example, if you roll six in the woods round of encounter charts, you get a, a human named November Vogler during the day. But at night, you might get And then let's see. And if you, oh, this is interesting. So they have some lycanthropes here. You get 1d4 plus one of them. During the day, they're in human form. If you find them at night, they're night, they're in wolf form. Also very cool. And there's a couple more of these. Winterfrid Frar. I guess those are 14 R5. Are those a uh, page? I'm, I'm guessing some kind of reference. And then, so there's during the day, but during the night, you might get Wicker John, the black dog. So I like that. That's a really nice touch. And then we have some modifiers to the table below. Plus one of carrying ripe elm unster cheese. Is that I'm guessing so the the if it's a plus, that means you're increasing the chance there's no encounter. So I guess we're saying that if you've got elm unster unster cheese and the smell's keeping things away a little bit. And it's plus six if you're in the ship in the tree hex. Okay, so you do roll for those whether you're in the named hex or in the numbered hexes, but if you're in the ship in the tree hex, there's a really good, it's really, you know, you're not going to, you're generally not going to get an encounter because you only have to roll, you know, a five, essentially a five or more. Terrence likes the color usage on the hex map. Yeah, it's good. I like it. And I like the just easy, nice, easy symbols. Uh, so we have an interesting, they've kind of doing a mixed forest thing. The interesting thing here, which I, I don't quite, I'm not sure I, I'm not sure we needed two, it looks like they're two different. Uh, so I guess what, here's what I would say. I like this a lot, and they're, they're using three mile hexes, one league, which I've been kind of enjoying recently. So I like it. The I, I wouldn't mind if the symbols were, if give me a key to tell me exactly what the symbols are. I'm guessing one of these is grassland. Maybe it's this one, and one is fens. Or fields and fens. But I can't, I, okay, I, I guess I have to look at, you kind of have to read them and say, okay, it's got this, 
So we got the witch's house, which seems to be, you know, okay, we'll probably be in a, a, probably be somewhere secluded like a fen. And you have the, the dashed lines are often used for water. So water, kind of swampy. So this is kind of our wetland. It's not very clear. And I can also see looking at that and thinking, oh, that must be like farmland or something, right? I, it's not clear enough that this would be, especially because the color to me doesn't read as like automatically, like, oh yeah, that's swamp. And then the other one, the one that is, I'm guessing must be grasslands, has an orangey brown color to it, which again, doesn't read to me as plant, grasslands, plains. Um, we do have kind of a thing here at the bottom where it gives our travel rates, which is nice, but it doesn't name the hexes. I wish you would just say, it seems like grasslands must be that one, but I have to, you know, I, I just have to do a little bit extra work in my brain. It's not a lot. It's not a big deal, but it also would be really trivial to somewhere in one of these corners or put something like, hey, these are the grasslands. These are the things. These are the other ones. And what I was going to say is that it's made a little bit more confusing by the fact that they're using two different, really three different forest hexes. So they have one forest hex design that's all looks like pine trees. Then you have one that's all the deciduous trees, essentially uh, non pine trees, uh, which I think is deciduous. I'm not. Uh, I'm not insane, I think. Then you have one that's mixed, which is over, or I guess this one's mixed. So you have the pine tree forest, which is here, 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 here. And then you have these mixed ones. I don't know if we need, I feel like it's just adding a little bit of extra thing. And I, I'm guessing these here, these darker ones are hills because they look like they have the hill underneath and they're also mixed. I like the hills ones. Though I might have said, put a little bit of brown in the hills, because if you're coming from kind of classic hex, uh, classic hex types, they're coniferous, right, or the pine trees, right? That's what I was thinking. So you have coniferous forest, and you have mixed with deciduous here. Just give me one type. Unless it's meaningful that there's different ones, the point of these symbols is you don't, you don't need to vary the symbols. Just give me one symbol that I can read. So just give me one symbol because I'm kind of looking at the like, is this, are these two hexes different? I, I don't think they are. It's, I'm sure they did it just to be, uh, you know, just to for variety for variety's sake, but I probably don't need it. And then maybe just be clear a little bit. You could just mark these up as being hills and you could do that by even having kind of the brownish tint in those for kind of hills. If we're going by kind of classic things, but these are all tiny little quibbles. It's a very nice hex map. Yep, raids got me covered on carnivorous. Okay, but I like, but I do like. I mean, I like the whole thing. I really like is you've got the travel, travel rates, so we don't have it. I would, like I said, kind of like with going back to having watches. If you don't, not sure, just say a watch is this many hours because you, you don't know what people have been playing. And I don't know if OSC like BX if, if they added because BX does not have really the concept of a watch. I don't know if OSC added it in, but if it didn't, just Put that because I think in the internet sort of community bubble, we think that everybody's got watches and all kinds of stuff, but a lot of folks might not. They might just go by hours. So it just adds a little bit of confusion. We say every watch, like, what is a watch? You know, so just give that. But I like here they have, hey, easy terrain, which would be looks like those grasslands, normal terrain would be the woods, and then difficult terrain looks like it's the swamps and those hills. Yeah, look, well, well the, uh, the hills, there is a difference in terms of travel. So it does, it is, it is, uh, it is meaningful in the travel sense. It's not meaningful in the sense of encounters, it looks like, but being in the hills does make it harder to walk. So you do want to note them. Uh, which one, you know, note those, note those hexes. I mean, I, I, look, nothing, nothing awful would happen if you just had no hills. Also, uh, but you know, there it is. I'm curious what's going on here because the river just seems to start in the table. We'll get there, but we have some, and we have some weather, which is also very nice because you never know if you need some, never know when you might need some weather. And we also have some other little chart here. Well, I'll say this this thing is very information dense in terms of what it's giving us, but it, it's 
it's maintaining good readability. Well, I, well, I say that, but I it's, that little text down there is pretty hard to read. Let's see. Okay, intended direction. All right, so we have this thing on wilderness travel here. We get weather once per watch again. Weather it basically goes from rain to sunny, but there's a sudden storm kind of thing. And then depending on what you roll the first time, the second time you roll, you, or the next time you roll, you might modify it, which is very easy to do. Encounters are checked once per watch. All right, we got that in some cases. See a table without a guide. Risk of triggering more encounters. Check twice per watch. Again, appropriate penalty on survival surprise rolls. So there's two things here. Once one is the concept of having a guide. I guess in the second is that that changes. If you don't have a guide, then it's there may it's more dangerous. Risk of getting lost even to a known location. Exit each hex in a random location. So these are without a guide. So without a guide, for example, if you are in the ship in the tree, you meaning to go to eleven, you might end up going to twelve, or you could go to ten. And they give you a table to roll about which direction. And I suppose that's good because I guess theoretically there's more woods out here. You could be. I'd probably want to steer them just in those three, though. Just just so that they don't wander off into the sunset. Goodbye. Kind of thing. And then we have some more encounters in the field, encounters in the fen. So far, so good. I mean, I feel like I'm already talking a lot about it. And I'm only on the first couple pages. Now we got, okay, so here, those are where those number references are. This is. What? Oh, Romage or Romoge. No, Romage. Population 98. That's a nice number, too. I, I always feel like sometimes in games we overinflate the numbers of people that should be in these little villages and whatnot. 98, I think, is good. All right, so we've got some. Okay, so it, they're really doing a nice job with the color coding. So you can kind of get pretty good at a glance. The text is fairly small, though, and I'm, I, I, this is one of those situations where I go, why not make it a little bit bigger on the map? Like, you know, Hunter, there's nothing else of interest here. Why not just blow that number up and put it nice and, and the, the text and put it nice and big? I mean, there's a few of these in town where that might get a little bit tricky, but I bet you you could sort it out pretty well. I don't think the either some of the surrounding lands in some of these cases or the shape of the building is really what's important. I mean, I could be wrong. Maybe you're getting into a combat at the little hunter's place and you need to know that it's got that outbuilding and it's a little L-shaped building, but probably it doesn't matter too much. Um, I would guess. Or, you know, do more... Um, I don't know if it makes sense to have more I I icon I icons. Probably not for this one. But on the flip side, I really like the fact that you're looking for day laborers, it's all the red ones. Communal buildings, all the blue ones. Purple is artisans, farms are green. I mean, just super nice and easy peasy. And we also have some different color coding. I don't know if that's meaningful, but we had this orange here, burnt sienna, maybe. And we got blue, and we got some yellow. Let's see. So we have got so we got all the buildings. Then we have what's the other side? Ray says they do like the breakup with the color, but is this usable info in the game? All these people, I mean, I'm I mean, they all have names, and we know that Vogler, for instance, is somebody you can meet out in the field. That was established. Whoops. So if we go back here, we could see that. Well, I don't know where Ricker John is, but there we go. November Vogler, the hunter. And then we get the reference. We didn't know what R14 was at the time, but that reference is there. So, and, you know, gameable information is always kind of tricky. This is, I, I imagine that what they're trying to do, and, we'll, you know, hopefully we'll get to, I mean, this is, feels like it's going to be taking, <laughs> I'm already 20 minutes in, uh, is giving you like a home base kind of thing. They're setting up this town. Presumably, so that you could use it for more than just whatever this adventure is. Or this adventure is going to take place, we don't know the scope yet, over a lot of time. So that you have these people. And the interesting thing is, by giving them all locations, what if the party kills Hunter Vogler? Suddenly, you've got this vacant house 
in town. I mean, you can even make notes and figure out like, oh, Hunter Vogler has been killed, maybe by the party. W what happens now? And so you get these things that could work for you. Now, it might be overkill. It depends. But I think a lot of this stuff, I think they're, you know, I get the sense that as a creator, right, you want to give people things in the sense that here, I'm giving you, like, I, I feel like there's a couple of things that happen. One is this just value for money, right? This is a $10 product. So we want to give you what we feel like is worth your money. And it's something we can put on the tin that like, hey, we've got this townie. And it's not like people don't love them. I mean, people will use Hamlet and stuff, right? Because, oh, I need a town. All right, go grab, go get the village of Hamlet. There you go. You've got a town, right? I need a keep. Go grab, keep on the borderlands. You've got a ready-made keep with everything. So I, I think there's something to, hey, you need a village. You know, someone will type up, hey, I need a starting village for my campaign. And someone might say, hey, go grab this adventure. It's a good adventure, and it's got a ready-made village full of individual people in it. Not too huge but you know there you go um is there a reason you need a distinction for instance between day laborer and artisan i'm not sure it might be that the day laborers are people you could get to try to come with you um uh, i think and you know or you know i don't know we'll have to we'll see what they say let's see if they say anything about it so we have day laborers, so we'll have to pay attention to see if we get any, if, if they make any distinction between day laborers and artisans. I mean, there is a sense that the artisans are more skilled labor and unskilled labor if you're using rules, for example, for retainers or hirelings. And I think Lamentations of the Flame Princess did that. I'm sure other games did it where there would be a distinction in price between whether you're getting an unskilled kind of laborer and a skilled laborer, like craftsperson. Then the craftspeople, the artisans, are going to be more valuable than the day laborers and they do different things for you depending but you know it's possible this stuff is going to be way overkill for you it's also possible you might use this i mean it doesn't take up a lot of space or anything i mean you know i'm always like i don't really need the map of the town which i don't i could have done but it is i can't say it's terrible to have um yeah raid says if they come into play as a faction quote-unquote faction maybe only lightly then that's great like these people would have info about each other because they were closer together or maybe if you treat one poorly it will affect others attitude yeah i mean i think it's i mean ultimately like all this stuff is really gonna be up to you as the gm so kind of what they're doing is they're giving you a bunch of stuff and then you as the game master as a referee will say oh i can use this stuff to do x y or z like i said i think this makes a lot more sense if this is a place you might plan to have the party hang around with but we'll you know, we got to, I got to keep moving. I got to keep moving because we're, I don't even know how many pages this thing is. And I'm already, already, I feel like running late and we're barely into it. Uh, we got this other side, which I don't know what that is. Something here. I got to hold on a minute. What is that? What is the other side? So there's something called the other side, but they haven't explained what it is. And there's different things there i guess i guess you know i'm guessing this stuff is i think what i'm gonna have to do is as uh as interesting as this stuff is i'm getting the sense that these are kind of your reference pages and we need to probably get in the adventure because obviously there's something where you're getting into this kind of t the, you're going to the dark side and so then this changes a bunch of this a bunch of the things about it giving me uh what was it, a link to the past link yeah i think that what the the Super Nintendo Zelda game, Link to the Past. Stranger Things, yeah, with the Upside Down. So we will see. We'll have to see. So they got they got that to look forward to also. All right, then we get some. Yep. So that those are so yeah. I almost I almost wish they put those at the back only because then I wouldn't have gotten sidetracked on it when we haven't even gotten to the to anything yet. Okay. This is old school essentials. by Hannah Strang by uh, Words Layout and Some Art Maps by Hexanome. Evelyn Moreau did some illustrations, did the illustrations by some logos, cartography, so on and so forth. All right, so let's read the four weird. This is an investigative adventure. This is an, uh, I probably shouldn't read so fast, forward or four weird. This is an investigative adventure. This is an adventure where most named opponents could easily kill the PCs and those who can't are children. This is an adventure that assumes the PCs gain XP from gold, but they aren't here to save the day, but have an opportunity to do so. This is an adventure with paths that lead to a heroic ending, 
which trusts the referee won't force their players in this or any direction. This is a living world. The story is whatever the players choose and the consequences of that. Some of the obvious themes throughout this module are childhood and the weight of a community's religious traditions, both lost and turned into an instrument of power. As always, the referee should feel free to pilfer this module for parts to drop in their own adventures. All right, that's great. So now we get the sense of what this is. Hey, Magnus. So investigative adventure, and clearly from the fact that a lot of the people, most named opponents, the fact that they can easily kill PCs means that that can't be the expectation of the first approach is swords out, spells locked and loaded, arrows cocked and ready to loose. Which is totally fine by me. We have a note about it being an open-ended module. So there is a timeline. And there are going to be, it looks like they're they're mentioning factions here by name. So presumably we'll, we'll get to some. Once the timeline goes off rail, thanks to the PC's actions, it's up to the referee to determine the events, maybe with the help of randomness. For example, if the curse hits in full, a few random villagers go to the moon dial. If there's no one to stop them, do they survive their encounter with the solar saint? Maybe they have a one in six chance. All right, so we're getting a little bit of hints as to what the adventure's about. There's obviously a curse. Something's going on at the moon dial. This should lead the adventure to a logical conclusion, unique to your table and impacted by the player's choices. Very excellent. And then we've got some inspirations. Let's see. The Wizard of Oz. The Alice books. Peter Pan. Inspired by, but not adapted from. The Visceral Viscountess is Alice is the Red Queen. Is something. Okay. Oh, I see. They're just putting some kind of inspired by for some of the characters. Okay. Now we get the table of contents. Well, we do have a note about other levels, which I'm not going to read at the moment. Table of contents. So here we get the formatting stuff, which would have been... <laughs> I might have liked before the uh, before we got the reference pages. Only for me, because I'm going kind of in, in order, and so I don't know. I don't know what I don't know when I'm, I flip open to the first pages. All creatures, let's see, all creatures, spells, and magic items not detail this book. Refer to old school essentials. That's fine. Uh, okay, I, asterisks. Items marked with an asterisk in room descriptions are developed below. Below, okay, letters and icons indicate, next one, Eric. Okay, so C will indicate a creature, S, a secret passage, T, a trap, a sun, or a moon. Demarcate things are relative, relevant only during the day or night. Dice. Signals that something should be determined randomly by the referee. What is a dice? I guess that's a symbol. I wish they would have put the symbol of the dice. I imagine it's going to be like a little D6 or something in there. Okay, so we have area numbers. There are page numbers and section names. So I guess here we have, so that's why you see bracket T. So anything with T something is going to be on that thing, which is cool. Could be a little bit confusing, but... I also like the note that, hey, this PDF is designed to be viewed as facing pages. That's kind of a nice touch, actually. We have a content warning because there is kind of themes of religious witch hunting and there's some stuff with children. And it looks like this is a pretty, pretty full-featured PDF that we can click on areas in the map and it will take us to those sections. A referee, and there's that, oh, right, there is another follow referee's toolkit, actually, which looks like it was pretty handy-dandy. Um, so I'll, we'll look at that at the end if we get there. I'm going to skip the what's happened, but I always like these. We get a long ago with the uh, village of, or yeah, I guess village of Romage. Then 300 years ago, something obviously changed. And then a month ago, we got kind of the thing that's maybe put the events of the module in motion now. So, and what happens? Enter the PCs. Also arriving as a vile band of inquisitors, the wolves of God, former bandits led by a disgraced cardinal. I like that picture too. Very cool. And now we have, uh, we're kind of getting into our timers. In two weeks, there's a festival. The villagers aren't sure whether it will happen. The wolves of God turn it into a bleak witch burning. If they burn the last follower of visceral Viscount of the visceral Viscountess, they unwittingly release the apocalyptic spell seeking the wicker witch, blasting everything within an eight mile radius. Well, that sounds not very nice. Now we have this table here of a threat to the village. What Fey Realm it's associated with, what the gods, what the wolves of God will do to interfere, and then who's got the info, which is really a nice little table, I must say. So we have the threat to the village. The I guess maybe the primary one, maybe, is the uh, the Moondial curse affecting the parents of the Romage, 
and it was uh, contained 300 years ago by the Solar Saint, but the wards are now fail failing due, due to bells. And we've heard the bells. They, we, saw, we saw the bells mentioned as a thing that happens. So that's interesting. So it's not even just, oh, there are church bells, there's a village nearby. It does mean it, it's, it's part of what's causing the wards to fail, which kind of makes it more eerie. And uh, uh, it, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? More atmospheric. If, if the part, assuming that the party realizes what the bells are doing. Then when they hear those bells, it's not just oh they're bells. It's like nope, something something creepy is happening. So the moon dial curse is associated with under the moon dial to the fallen duchy of eleven, which is probably that the kind of dark side maybe. And the source of the curse, there are three fey children. Three fey children await to be exchanged for mortal ones. And then the wolves of God are going to interfere. Let's see, they're going to forbid acts that would lift or forestall the curse. You know, screaming out, Phatrix! Heresy! And they want power over the village. And then the Solar... Who's got more info on this? The Solar Saint, who wants to protect children, both mortal and fae. And then the character Bear, or Barry. Barry! Uh, who's, I guess, a fae child. And now a hermit in the woods. And then the Wicker Witch, who doesn't seem to know much, but if she's convinced, will help. Now there's, let's see, there's the spell targeting the Wicker Witch that w the spell targeting the Wicker Witch would destroy the village, which is released when the faltering cult of the Visceral Countess dies out, where we saw a, a reference that earlier is associated with the Black Pond. Uh, this go Okay, so this goes to the other side, which is the Visceral Viscountess's realm. A ritual and song, the old way, open it, and it's the key to rekindling the Viscountess's now, the wolves of God will interfere by seeking to eradicate the old pagan cult when they learn about it. The Wicker Witch is no longer protected, and the apocalyptic spell finds her. And who has info? The villagers, the Wicker Witch, and the Visceral Viscountess. I like these little notes. Really nice. Wow, now we got a cheat sheet, which I also like, but I'm not going to go through it, but you have a nice kind of schematic sort of thing. Wolves of God obviously touching a bunch of stuff, but it's kind of nice because you can. Uh, and it, oh, yeah, oh, look at that, and the page numbers are linked. It's also nice. So you can kind of reference quickly. Oh, like what's going on? Or, you know, I'm here. Oh, yeah, this is what the Wolves of God are trying to do, or, you know, connections between things. So it's very nice. Now we get to the Wolves of God, led by Cardinal Kramer von Kaltenbach. Wolves of God arrive in Romage on foot on day two. PCs close to the church might have heard of Inquisitor Kaltenbach's cruelty. Oh, I like that. Magnus says they keep getting confused because they think Kevin Crawford has a game called Wolves of God. Uh, they yes, he did. It's not um, it's not out anymore. Took it down. It uh, but yes, I don't know if it was called Wolves of God, but it might have been. But yes, it was uh. It was about uh, this kind of Mormon, had a Mormon theme, a 19th century kind of Mormon theme. But I think because of that, he, ended, he eventually took it down. There's another game that's basically a retro clone of that game, which you can get at drive through. I don't recall the name. A little bit disappointing because a little bit, I haven't read it, so I don't know how much value added it has. But it seemed a little bit expensive for what it feels like it was literally just, you know, scratching the serial numbers off of that other game and posting it so your miles may vary with that but it's it, there is something there if you had heard of wolves of god because they seem to have some pretty cool systems in it i had a digital copy of it from way back when but yeah out of, out of out of print and unlikely to be revived from what i gather these are different these are not not uh mormon police all right, so we have some stuff about Kramer von Kaltenbach. Obviously, he's not a nice person. By exploring nearby sites, PC should figure out what needs to be done to save the hamlet. Then they likely need to convince the village council to take measures, though they could think of other ways. The wolves fiercely oppose these solutions. They are heretical and weaken their hold over the hamlet. At least at first, the council favors the wolves. Oh, dot, dot, dot. Oh, I am. Oh, okay, Magnus. I see. Sorry, yes, we are thinking of different games. What is the other one? It's, uh, yeah, the other thing of, oh, I can't remember what it is now, but I, I, I don't know if the other one's called Wolves of God, but yeah, oh, I see what you're talking about. Yeah, there's that other game, right, where you're sort of Reavers. 
your kind of old uh, old English, like Anglo-Saxons, I think. But yeah, yeah, we are talking about two different things. What is the one I'm thinking of called if it's not called Wolves of God? I don't recall. I don't even know if that's by Jeremy Crawford either. I don't know. But there's the one about the Mormons. I'm thinking of, oh, Dogs in the Vineyard. Thank you. Yes, my confusion. Yes, I was thinking of Dogs in the Vineyard. Yeah, Wolves of God, I've, I've seen some bits about too. My mind, as usual, is mushy. We have wolves. So we have a bunch of stuff on the wolves of God. I'm not going to read through it, but I appreciate that it's here because this is our main antagonist and we get a nice spread, basically. Giving us all the uh, all the things we're going to need to know to kind of get us in the mindset of the wolves. And we get the roster, which is also very nice. We get all, all named folk here, too. And we got names, hit points. A quirk or a note, their primary weapon and its damage, and the loot that they have. Mother Lamute, Lam or Meute, Lamute, Mute. Abbot Clark's sister for lust or fear lust, Friar Geld, Pastor Peccatore, Abbas Abgrund, Brother Bosch, Sister Rouge, Father Albrecht, Vicar Ulvarg, and finally Monsignor Kramer von Kaltenbach. Holy writs of Inquisition, I am the one they emanate from. I am the law. All right, and I guess we're going to get stats, or at least for some of these later, but very cool. I like that's a nice. I like that these are numbers so potentially to roll on there to see, but uh, Monsignor is not. Hey, Suez. Uh, all right, and then we have, oh, wait, we have some wolves of God, werewolves. Oh, are they all werewolves? Or some of the werewolves. Is that human form, wolf form? I guess, oh yeah, maybe that's their wolf form? I don't know. Are they? I don't know. Or are these in addition to these named ones? Do his legs say they have a recap or roster? Yep, I do too. Mundane damage immunity in the wolf form. Can only be harmed by silver weapons or magic. On oh, the Cardinal's Ring, which is a ring of protection plus two. Got some cleric spells. And then has the other traits as of the Wolves of God. Very cool. I get the ad adventure timeline. The default timeline is set during harvest. The harvest festival, Alt Sun Fasht, held on the Equinox, an astronomical event which has no bearing on the adventure, serves as a soft deadline, signaling to the players that they have limited time. It can be replaced by any seasonal fare. So we're told so we have the Moondal curse, and we get again when the uh, where it is kind of before things break, when the third ward's ward breaks, which happens only if bells are being rung at night. So I'm presuming maybe we can stop that. And then the last ward breaks, which happens only if the bells are being rung at night. Okay, so I guess at some point, how do we know when those are? Before the adventure begins, all right, two wards are broken. The referee random selects four houses affected by the fake curse. Curse parents of children under 13 wonder if their kids have been replaced. They're almost sure they haven't been, except half the time when they aren't so sure. And then you roll a new house every two days until the third ward breaks. And then when that breaks, you roll a new house every day. And when the last ward breaks, you get paranoia, despair, and rage. And then we have the Wolves of God. Every day, a group of 1d4 plus 1 Wolves of God investigate two households. Roll two d two times a d20 on the Hamlet key. Check the wolves visit box. Oh, that's nice. When a track is full, the wolves arrest one or more residents of that house. Reasons can be found on the household descriptions. True or false is often up to the referee. Arrested villagers are kept captive in the church where they are interrogated. And then you have the Alt Sun Fasht, where... Some captives are presumably going to be found guilty. Innocents will be released after the fair, and there's some exception here. And then, and then we have what happens to the so what happens to the PCs do nothing. And then we get a nice again a nice table here with a timeline. Bells start ringing. I think those are before the PCs arrive. Yep. So the PCs arrive. That's kind of clever too. So we give us some days before the PC show, which means that if we so chose, we could actually have the PCs show up earlier and we'll have information to run the adventure you know if we wanted to we wanted to give them like if i felt like oh maybe my pcs are a little bit low level let's 
have them show up a few days before the wolves of God arrive. So we'll, you know, we'll come back here. So then we'll have these to play with. So it's kind of nice. And it also means that if you're asking characters what's been happening recently, you have some information. You know, oh, what happened September 9th? Oh, about a month ago, the bell started ringing at night. Oh, okay. Right. You kind of have some, not, you can just, I can just get that from the chart, from this table, which is cool. And then we get all, everything that happens. And then, you know, Equinox, the Harvest Festival, the Witch Burning, or the Prismatic Typhoon. One of those is likely to happen. The most excellent, I like that, the most excellent Prismatic Typhoon. Hovering somewhere, an overloaded rainbow, forbidden fey warfare, the greatest storm ever crafted. Spell level, yeah, sure. I like it. Duration lasts an hour. Area effect likely centered one mile north of Romage, halfway between the Wicker Witch and her other. Expands 3d6 times 10 feet per round, about 6 to 8 miles per hour, up to an 8 mile radius. Hits the Hamlet in 8 minutes. And the effect is the creatures in the area with 8 hit dice or less are blinded for 2d4 turns. Creatures in the area suffer a random effect each round. And we have some random colors. When the storm ends, the ground is leveled and vitrified. Radioactive pearlescent surface. Mundane objects are vaporized. Magic items have a 1 in 6 chance to survive. If only if they're uh, more than a mile from ground zero. So you probably don't want that to happen. And we got some aftermath. Now we get some. Ah, here we go. Now we got what well, time keeping in travel. So here I was dinging it a little bit for not giving me watches. They are using four watches of four to eight hours long. So that's just what I needed to know. Because that affects a lot when you're saying roll for an encounter every round. Every every watch, and there's basically a 50% that's of an encounter every watch. If your watches are, say, two hours long, that's a lot. So now we know that, okay, eight hours, four to eight hours long. So great, we've got that. And we have, so we got some actions, which they didn't need to give us, but they gave us the stuff, which is excellent. We again get this chart with the travel rate. I still wish that they would just name... Could you just name the terrain types for me, please? Just so I know. I'm pretty sure this is grasslands. This is forest, swamps, and hills. That makes sense. But I would just love, 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 love if you would just tell me. And we have these same things. And we get the weather. And I also like that it's duplicated. So we had the one thing with just charts. So we're, we're kind of really... We've been playing the game or we, we have already know everything has been internalized. We just have the charts that we need. But here we do get it with where it's a little bit more explanation. Fields and pastures. Encounters in the fields. We might get some Wolves of God or Wicker John, the Black Dog at night. No encounter on a 5+. plus. Distant church bells on a 3. Deer or elk. And then we get... To, and again, this is in the... Uh, these are all the same ones that are in the, the chart, but again, we just get some explanation. Brian Smith points out that the font in the headers are more Kaburgish and difficult to read. It is. Yes, I, I will I will agree with that. I was gonna mention it. I hadn't yet. Yes, they, it is that kind of hyper hyper gothic font. Uh, for some reason it is reading to me. I, like I haven't had that thing that happened to me with the Murkburg score book where I just really couldn't make heads or tails of it. For some reason, I've been able to read them all, which is why I haven't stumbled, I haven't stumbled over it yet. But yes, I, I would agree that if they'd gone with a slightly less gothic font, I would not have uh, I would not have batted an eye. Uh, and it's it's funny too, because it doesn't really match the rest. I, I'll say it's probably the one thing that feels a little bit incongruous. Nothing else has kind of a gothic font. They're not really going for that kind of look anywhere else. So I would have been fine with something different, even if it was just using this same font here, but just enlarged. But yeah, I can, uh, for, some, for whatever reason, this one, maybe they maybe they found the perfect font that's super kind of uh, elaborate, ornamented, but yet, for whatever reason, hasn't gone over that, at least for me, hasn't gone over that line where I got to stare at it for five minutes to figure out what it is. We got fields and pastures, which is great. We have the Hamlet of Romage. So it's a Hamlet. We have some quotes here. It's awful. Some of us, they say they're children. They feel they've been replaced by Fay. Why? Why is this happening again? Do you think? Can you? Can you help? And I like these faces. 
a colorful cluster of well-kept, cozy, half-timbered houses, roofs slated or thatched. White and red storks bills bedeck the windowsills. I don't know what a storks bill is in that, but I like the I like the flavor nonetheless. Iron horseshoes are nailed above nearly every opening, many of them brand new. That's a nice, that's a really nice little touch. You know, because it's signifying that these people are looking for some good luck or protection from evil any way they can. And so they're all getting this, they're all taking new horseshoes and jamming them up over their homes. And it's just a nice little detail that you can filter out to the party, or you know, maybe if they take a closer look, whatever, you can say, Oh, this got a horseshoe and it's new. Like it's just a nice little because it just gives us a nice little hint at what's going on without being kind of over the top or anything like that. The mood, anxious and paranoid, there's a, there's a lake, and then there's the festival field, the Kilbacher. We have some rumors and gossip. Magna says that iron also repels Fey in some interpretations. Okay, cool. I mean, even that little, I mean, is it is it just the presence of... I know about iron and fey, but I, I I would not have thought that uh, a horseshoe would have uh, over your door would have been that much protection. But is it or is it you know is there something more to it? But yes, I, I know about the fey and the iron. But I thought that was like you know if you stick them with iron or if you touch them with iron. But I, I didn't know that I, does iron have a a force field? Does it project out to some kind of radius? Does that have protection from fey thirty feet cast on it? We have rumors and gossip. We've got events and encounters. Let me just do one. Let's just say number, oh, well, I was going to say 15, nothing, but there's a wolf howling in the distance, which is a nice touch. Kramer and Wendy Six Wolves corner a lone PC to inquire about their findings. Interesting. I, so sometimes these are tricky because this lone PC, I don't, I don't, uh, what's the word? It just, it's a little bit awkward. I guess, because if you just try to do that, I think what ends up happening is there's a, a temptation from the GM to do that. Oh, okay, the wolf got corner alone PC, right? You're going to have this moment where they're, but then it's like, well, none of the PCs are traveling alone. So how am I going to contrive to get them alone? I would just say the corner of a random PC or try to attempt to two corner, like, you know, and then you can just play out the whole scene. If then there's three other PCs there or they're all together. Then you can see as they maybe try to get one person alone or kind of talk to them and not have to come a con have some contrivance of, well, you just happen to step away around a corner into an alley and then you get jumped. And the player's like, I wasn't gonna do that. I'm not I'm well aware of danger in the area. That's not what I would do, kind of thing. Brian says they like the idea of the Hamlet spreads the word of wards with no proof. Old Jim said if you wear white, you get messed with, everyone starts dying and hanging clothes. Dying as in dying their clothes, not white. Nara says they have an iron bulb of, bulb of garlic. Double duty. Yep. Add some wolf's bane on top of it and you'd have a, a whole anti-magic uh, creature salad. Oh, what else do we've got? Yeah. So here we have the map again. And, you know, again, I appreciate the fact that they're not afraid to kind of double dip on the uh, information. Because we have this in the front. They're giving it to us again. I'm okay with that. I know there'll be somebody saying, I don't know why they gave us the map twice. Well, they did. And I'm okay with it. But, you know, you guys, I suppose you could cut it out of your copy of the book if it offends you. And here we get even a little bit more detail. So now kind of getting into answering, maybe it was, what was it, Raid's question of how Gameable, all this stuff is. So we're definitely getting some information. We have Father R. Faced and Miss Emma Hirschner. Oh, see, look at that. So they're giving you a lot of stuff here. So if your party wants to go and be, uh, what's the word? Do some <laughs> freelance work in the village. They're giving you stuff that's in there. Hey, you can go break into the study in the church. I mean, that's a little bit, you know, for shame. But there's a, there's 150... A gold holy symbol worth 100 gold pieces and an illuminated holy book worth 150 gold platinum pieces. Or no, gold pieces. Sorry, not platinum. Um, so, you know, you you can, they're giving you a lot of stuff, which again supports this, I think supports the idea of they're making, they're giving this place a lot of depth so that you can potentially use this place for more than just the adventure. If you wanted to do a whole bunch of stuff here, you can. And of course, we have these nice little check boxes here. 
which I wonder why they didn't put on the map, but maybe there's just too much to put where you, when the wolves visit, and then you have the wolves visit once, twice, but then the third time they strike. So, what, do they all have two boxes? I wonder. We'll see. We have the communal hall where they're going to hold meetings and whatnot. And we have factions. So households of Romage are roughly labeled to assist the referee's quick assessment of the reactions and likely council votes. Oh, so you have two reasons why to have. So there's the council voting and then kind of factionalizing them. So yes, they, they are basically factions or voting blocks. So artisans, they're richer but own no land. If everything went south, many could consider making life elsewhere. So they have, right, they're not tied to the land and they have valuable skills. So they will probably the first ones that'll be ready to hightail it. Day laborers are poor or poorer. Some have rights to exploit the Earl's forest, also lend their services to the farmers. They're strongly attached. And then finally, the farmers, they're the most prosperous and they owe it to the cheese. The vast majority would not consider abandoning the hamlet. They're, they are, all of their wealth, all of their prestige and whatnot is locked into the land. And then what's their relationship to the tradition? And we have some nice icons to help us with that. There are some who like to want to preserve, some who are neutral, and some who are loose. Loose, loose like a goose, long neck goose, even. The monk with three keys. Ooh, they got the curse on the wolf's visit. Nice. She's palace, Fletcher slash hunter. Ah, so she, she can be a guide. So some of these have services and goods. I read that's a really nice. I like I like the layout. I like what they're giving us. Like easy to find stuff, and they're giving us a lot of a lot of things. Uh, like I said, I feel like some people are going to see this as overkill, but I don't know. I mean, it almost seems like they could just give us the they could he or the author, the group, whatever could have created just the starter village and threw it out there. But certainly, next time somebody asks me if they, they need kind of a they want a fleshed out village that they can do things from, this is a good option at least how it reads to me i don't know you guys can tell me but we're getting a lot of stuff going on that you can just tie different things in there different plot hooks different things and and i feel like they are building in some significance to the adventure when they are going to vote on stuff it's going to be meaningful when you are dealing with different factions they're going to they're going to be meaningful general goods the draper and weaver the blacksmith and farrier the miller's home there's a healer and Chandler, there's a woodcutter. Woodcutter! Another woodcutter. So one woodcutter doesn't offer any services, but the other woodcutter does. He, he will be a torch butter. Torch butter. Torch bearer. Oh, I see. There are. Or, oh, I see. So one of them will be. So there's Rukers. The Rukers, there's Winnen, Bran, Keelan, and Torin. And also Aunt Ashling, Ashling, and then Ludwig, Winnen's grandfather. So Bran, for five silvers apiece, will torch bear for you. He's the 20 year old. Or she. I don't know if it's a male or female name, and it doesn't matter. None of the Tiefen Wurzels will do it. Oh, but their house is haunted. But it seems like it's a good kind of haunting. There's the Vogler, there's uh, November Vogler, Fierce Vogler, and Miracle. Don't forget Uncle Hans and Tace or Take or Tache. Not sure. So they will guide to the Fen and the. Oh, okay, that's cool. So they even give you different destinations. So Sersha will guide you to the Fens. November will guide you, I guess, into the woods or through the woods, maybe. And they have some goods. They have the bell ringers, the Rysix. And uh, let's say Aubrey Rysix will be your torchbearer if you need it. Which is also nice too, because the other thing is that it, imagine your, your party's coming through and they picked up, they've hired some of these people. They're not just nameless kind of random hirelings. They're people in the village. So I'm curious when tables play this, if they treat those hirelings differently because <laughs> like they're named NPCs. If you if you take on Aubrey, uh, let's see, her name's Aubrey Rysick as your torchbearer, and she goes down somewhere, 
people. Like there's a real effect. You know, again, talking about the factions, talking about these people, like that name gets crossed off this list. Clearly, the other Rysix are probably not going to be your friends. Maybe even others won't. It's not just like, oh, random dude number five fell down a well. It feels like you're going to want, I mean, I imagine I would want to treat them better than just random hirelings. Right? Smith says this much detail overwhelms them during the play. It's well done, though, and good work. Uh, it, it, interesting, Brian Smith, because I wonder, is it so, because you could presumably skip over a lot of this if, if you didn't want it. Is it, uh, what, what kind of, I'm curious, what is your, what is your kind of ideal for the information? Because I feel like it's, I, I mean, I, it seems like it's presented in a pretty solid way. Like, everything's in the space and you sort of have it. Uh, but obviously if, if my feelings of whatever is overkill versus other people's, I get the sense I'd just love to, love to know what do people think kind of what makes it overkill or, or where does this land in the sort of in, in your overkill to not overkill spectrum or what do you what do you feel like they should cut out if something cut out do you not like that they're all named do you not like would you prefer oh, I just spilled some water would you prefer they put all the say all the sale stuff in one place and just have a generic adventure store as opposed to having all these separate farms and stuff. Right, so it says they'd have to pause and consult the book. Who's here and names and family. Okay. I mean, this. so I will say that, yeah, this will probably, something like this would probably benefit from having some pregame kind of prep. Just to kind of make some notes, do some things. But I, I, I think you could probably skip whatever, you know, there's not a gun to your head saying you got to use everything. So, Feel free not to. But I understand that it's hard not to when it's all there for you. You feel like to look through it. I do think that they've kind of laid it out in a way that good use of bold, good use of highlighting to kind of make everything fairly findable. But yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be personal for everybody. We get a nice map of the church, St. Elm's Church. Oh, we have the graveyard. There's let's see, a few centuries old headstones bear strange spiral carvings and unusual epitaphs. These are the graves of villagers blessed by the visceral Viscountess. There's a two and six chance descendants remember tales about their ancestor having some weird power indeed. So, Vern Selig, epitaph is no sickness could ever hurt him. And then, I'll just read one more. El Gunt Gesundheit, never scared of no wizard. And then we have a note about the wolves. On arrival, up to nine wolves of God, including Ulvarg, take their quarters inside the church. All may move in eventually. And then we have some blue numbers on the map that basically indicate the wolves' initial positions. Ignore numbers above the present total, i.e. if there are 12, 10 wolves at the church, no one is in C4 because C4 is would be 11, right? Yeah. Let's see. Brian Smith says... It's not for each session as normal. It's uh, I note for each session as normal, but I would for sure lose big chunks in translation book to table. Oh, okay, that's all right though. But you know they're different styles, right? And I think that's you know like the uh, bat. Not oh, what's his name? Um, not bat in the attic. Uh, Ten foot pole, right? Obviously has things that he really likes. I know that when I talk to Daniel, there are things that. At least we don't like because we know we're going to do things, right? So for me, having something super simple where it's just a little reference generally works okay because I'll read it and it hopefully will get my imagination going and I'll run with whatever my imagination does. And if the, if the game had given me a bunch more stuff, it would have made for more reading, but I don't know that ultimately I wouldn't have just done what I wanted to do anyway. And so having something very short and maybe evocative but certainly not a lot of detail, is is okay. And then other folks obviously like where they're giving you more because they don't want to do, you know, someone's going to say, I don't want to do that stuff. Why? Like, if you, if you, you know, and which I get. Like, hey, you've got this family. You say there's a family of five farmers here. Why don't you name them for me? Because what I'm going to have to do is if the party shows up, I'm going to have to sit there and go through of naming them. So you could just do that for me and name them. And then that's saving me a minute, two minutes, 10 minutes, whatever, of going through and making up names in the moment when the party decides to, when I didn't think they were going to go to that farm, they do. Now I got to name them. Like, I get that too, right? And this has gone even a whole other step. Like, well, here's what each 
platform offers and and whatnot. I guess if it doesn't, if it's not too, if it's well done, which this seems to be like well put together, and it's not. It's not blowing up the book to some huge degree. Like this, you know, if this were like, oh, it's a 500 page book and it could be 100 pages because they just went overboard, then I'm okay with having the more because I can always cut out less. But if I don't get, if I don't get inspired, if I don't have an idea, then having the more probably helps me more than if you just said like farmer. And then if I don't have an idea or, you know, you say an angry farmer, something, but it doesn't, if it's whatever reason, whatever the thing that the author thought would be evocative doesn't evoke anything in me, I got nothing. Whereas this one, I can keep reading a little bit more. All right, Smith says, their preference is terse and memor memorizable. And I think there are some other folks that go with that too. But like I said, I, I think you can do a lot of that here because you could go back, for example, just using like this. That's just got some names. Like, you know, you could run your the town just from here. And not not really get into the details, and you could even ignore the names if you wanted to, right? Or you can get in that section and get more details on that stuff. So I kind of feel like you could play it. They've done a fairly good job of marking it out so that you want to use that stuff, you can. You don't. You don't. Um, but yeah, it's this is definitely. I wouldn't call this terse and memorizable. There's certainly, I mean, at least it's too much for me to memorize. All right, so we got the church. Now we have the Wicker Fen, which is this area down here. Got some features, and that's some more nice art. Some sandstone mounds, and it's a meandering wetland. So here they, I wish they would have put some naming. I, I, I get it. I was able to figure it out, but, you know, for people, for less, for, you know, less, uh, Powerful hex mages than me. Help them out. Not, not for me by gum. For others. I mean, some encounters. Ooh, there's a fen hex blasting fen firebird. Oh, I like that. And now we have when the wolves come for granny on day eight, which is September 16th, six to eight wolves of God venture into the fen to capture the wicker witch. As they drag her out, she unleashes both defense tornadoes. The surviving wolves bind her in cold iron, tie a bag over her head, and gag her. In the evening, they bring her back to the church. They leave her trussed up, unfed, until the festival. That's not very nice. And then, let's see. So she rolls 2d6. We roll 2d6. And then, I guess... These are casualties. So I guess you're just kind of rolling for the you roll for the results of the battle, presuming the party isn't there. So assuming that the party isn't there and they haven't whatever hasn't, you know, they haven't uh, neutralized the wolves of God by day eight or done something to make them change their plans. When they go to get her, you can roll a D two D six, and then this will kind of give you the casualty, which is kind of cool. So you don't have to play it out. You don't even really, you know, it's like it's just a really you don't have to ask yourself that question of like, well, what happened? You know, or do I, you know, do I need to, you don't have to go on the Reddit and say, do I need a, just roll a die and you got it. And we have the Wicker Witch here, whose name is Baba Vichrika or Vichrika, I'm not sure, Granny Gale, Mamie Tempest, the Wicker Witch, aka Esmaragda, the Storm Crafter of the Duke of Eleven. Now, that's some cool names. Storm Crafter of the Duke of Eleven. Of Eleven. Come on now. She's AC zero, aka nineteen. Eight hitch dice. Eight hit dice with three asterisks. Thirty six hit points. Got some attacks. I feel like she's strong enough that wouldn't she take out at least one? I mean, I know there's some of these results, but it seems like uh, there should be something. I wonder if you're supposed to roll up, and the more you get, it's all of those? I don't know. I don't know. But she's got some info, too. And we got a little map to the Witch's Abode. Twisters, skeletons. Where is the Wicker Witch? Dun, dun, dun. 
the Streamside Playground, Garrow's room, Stan and Leon's room. Garrow, Stan, and Leon, the Wicker Children. They're kind of creepy. Metal Tornadoes. Okay, so maybe they did, I guess, yeah, so I see. So, depending on what happens, some of the tornadoes, which have names, Villana and Bestinda. These are all the defenses. I, th I see. Okay, so I think from that other, if we go back here, what's going to happen is, you know, they come in to get her, and basically you're rolling to see how much of the, her defenses essentially went off, and they did. And so you're kind of rolling through there. I would I would have them all, be, I guess I, I guess cumulative, I think they mean in that. If I roll three, 1d3 winged skeletons and a random wolf of God. I think that's how I would do that. I think that makes sense. Now into the forest. Oh, and Wicker John is literally a black dog. Cool picture. Dark forest, mossy trees vying for arboreal supremacy. And here we go. Now we get the forest hexes. Normal and then difficult. I'm get, I'm you know, I still I have to imagine these are forested hills, but it might be nice to get. I mean it visually is what it looks like, but like again, why not? Why not just come out and say it? Okay. We got the things, we got the counters, which is again repeated in front. We've got the, the black dog. And there's a note here about poaching. Killing game bigger than a rabbit is the prerogative of the Earl. Hunting rights are granted to, to Romage, where two people are free to hunt in the forest. Anyone can get wolves and get a reward. One gold piece per pelt. Nice to know. The Saint's Tomb. Brian Swiss says winged skeletons are fun. All kinds of skeletons are fun, I find. The Saint's Tomb. Field sarcophagi. Now I get the ship of the tree. The boy who grew old, Captain Bere, apex predator. Navigating under the placid foliage in a flamboyant attire, Bere, I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that correctly, probably not, has the heart and mind of a child caught up in a centuries long game of playing pirates. He introduces himself with panache. Capitan Bere, scourge of the dangerous bullet. Bane of the perilous bolet, and precarious friend is the very parlous and problematic bellet at your service. Oh, but he can be a mighty crocodile, too. Listen to him as he bellows in the night. And he's a half-elf shapeshifter. I like that there's the, 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 the bullet, bolet, and bellet. And what happened to him when the Solar Saint came in? He was able to slip out because he is half human. He doesn't know that's the reason. Still half subject to the Moondal curse, his body grew older, but his mind remained a child. His long isolation took a toll on his mental health, as it would. And there we get the ship in the tree with its above decks and below decks and the aft castle, if you were wondering. We have a weasel burrow. Fun. Oh, Bellet! It's a weasel. Nice. Yeah, I had some. Uh, was it, were they ferrets or weasels? But I, I had some giant weasels my party tried to hunt one time. Gave them a lot more trouble, I think, than they were expecting. Now we get to the moon dial. Moonstone. Now the house under the moon dial. Oh, cool. So the three moon children are, have roughly the size and demeanor of nine-year-olds. As long as the curse holds, they do not age. They were four, but Barry was able to run away. They missed their parents, fey nobles who cast the curse to save them 300 years ago. They call the solar saint Godfather. He calls them godlings. He spent decades teaching them about his faith. They listened, but it remains alien to them. Like fairy tales, sometimes the arch of skeptical mortal children. And there's raison d'etre, lavender twig, and Peter satire. Peter satire? Or Peter satire? Peter satire? And then there's St. Elm Unster, Beatific Knight, Undying Paladin, Champion of St. Oriel, Patron of the Noon Sun. Oh, when he's undead. Encounters. So we got encounters, we got some random events, we got the wolves coming, parents, and then escalations of events. And then we have a MIP. Hopscotch Court, Peter's Brass Marbles. Knuckle bones, the fairy door. Do, 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 do. Nice. I like that they add the color on the inside. It's kind of cool. 
portal to Blasted Fairy. Beyond the portal lies a cold wasteland, shimmering with prismatic rainbow hues. Only children under 13 may pass through. Once three children have crossed over, the portal closes. The cur curse affecting Ramage is lifted. The moon children may exit the cage, and the parents of the children who left believe the moon children are their own. That's kind of an interesting thing, because it seems like you're sending some kids off to be in a blasted wasteland, but that will end the curse. Interesting. Story time with Twig. Twig will tell you some stories. And then the house under the moon dial. Oh, that's just is that continuing now. Hi, Cameron. Oh, I see. That's is, this is the house, the literal house. Okay. We have the black pawn. Witchcraft at dawn. Cracks begin at the edge of the woods. Every morning at first light, Lisbeth Wisdorn drags a bag to the black pond filled with ashes, lamb's blood, and an animal alive. There she drowns it, a clandestine, pointless attempt to stop children from being swapped for changelings. Tis a curse, she says. She's not wrong, but her remedy is too weak. Oh my gosh, does that mean you're supposed to... Does that mean you gotta, you gotta sacrifice something bigger? The old way. Oh, it's like a, like a nice poem or something, so let's read this. The old way. One pint of milk, prick your finger. Buy twelve and one hours beneath black glass. Turn up on turnip shore. Toss a wineskin to Porter Jack. On the other side of the swirled sheen, it's always night and it's always summer and you're always 13. You may visit for 13 hours or remain forever. Childhood keepsake you shall bear. Without it, you shall never pass. Give it up on upturned shore or you'll never come back. Well, there you go. So this is kind of like your instructions. And then we get, that's pretty cool. Now we get to the other side. All right. So if you were to, if, if the PCs happen to go in here, and I'm not sure why they would, I'm curious. If there's information somewhere, but you know, I'm I'm scanning. I'm not reading everything, so please do not take what I'm saying as an indication that it isn't there at all or anything. But just in my scanning, in my scanning, I haven't seen where that really given why the PCs would do this, but there's probably a reason they might. So you're always 13 means that the PCs are kids again, and they're level one again. Because remember, this is a uh, three to four, level three to four adventure, and of course, depending on when they come, they maybe they even have leveled up since then. You may visit for thirteen hours. Mortals and fae alike can visit this realm for a total of thirteen hours during their lifetime. Oh my gosh! Ooh, not just during a day, during a lifetime. Uh, Elizabeth spreading fake news. Brian Smith says and says Brian Smith always thirteen by John Cougar Mellencamp. Nice. I might have gone with uh, oh, uh, what's his name? Um. Oh, what is it, that doofy guy's name? Uh, like Summer of 69. What was his name? Brian. Uh... Oh, I can't remember. I got my, my mind mushing out. But yeah, Cougar Mellencamp. Mellencamp's a good one. Good choice. If the pieces are stranded, they can get involved with ongoing pl plots. But in the end, they will have to negotiate with or move against the visceral Viscountess. He needs help getting the PCs to overstay gives her the wellage. Ah, oh, so there might be a reason why someone might be trying to keep them. The Fey Moon is a clock. The passage of time for each person is marked by the course of the full ultramarine and oxblood Fey Moon. It crosses the violet starless night skies from west to east in exactly 13 hours. When the PCs first arrive, the moon is fully to the west. Oh, nice. Brian Adams is who I was thinking of. Brian Adams. Brian Adams for Brian Smith. That makes perfect sense to me. And then we have some... Oh, this is, okay, so this is a point crawl. So we went from a hex crawl on this side, now we got point crawl, and so this is why you've got these... I'm guessing some of these arrows stuff. All right, so we have, some. I guess, some rules for topology. Reaching the edge of the map, the characters seamlessly re-enter on the opposite side, crossing the edge parallel to one they just crossed. Parallel. So does that mean, I guess that means from this corner to where the unicorn is, you'd end up at the white knight. Maybe. It says on a VTT, it might not be worth hiding their new location to the PCs. It doesn't matter that much. Thanks, Ray. I'll see you. Yep, I, I beat you to it. But yeah, it was Brian Adams. Or at least with the delay, I didn't see it. Until I'd already remembered. Cool. So that's the other side. Now we have the visceral Viscountess. I don't know. She got a long tongue. But she's also got some funky wings and looks like some. I guess I guess it's just her dress torn where the her mothy wings have come out.
clad in virginal white, splattered with her hematic ink blots, whose changing patterns mimic those adorning insects. On her back sprout self made wings of found feathers and dead flowers. Her brow is crowned with twisted horns. Her supple neck is too long, like a swan's, like a snake. There are twin tongues in her mouth. Oh, two of them. A glossy red one that only speaks truths, and a sickly white one, like a drowned thing that always utters lies. They call her a Viscountess, but here her heart is sovereign. Bada bum bum bum. All right. We have some random encounters. Ah, Jub Jub. Jub Jub Junkies. The Chesper Smilodon. Oh, look at that. Very, very Wonderlandy right there. Lily Tiger Doom. Brian Smith likes the, uh, the poem delivered in a classic rock ballad style. See that? Okay, so there is kind of a chess, chess piece aspect here. Loot me. Roll at the beginning of each encounter. Fix a random. NPCs may use them. If numbers roll twice at that many gold pieces. All right. Linen handkerchief for the lenders. Initials LR. Reeks of cheese. Has a three in chance six of causing any opponent to flee if they smell it. Okay. So these are some interesting items you can pick up. And there's eat me. So this is definitely, you know, man, we're getting kind of wonderlandy down here. Animals speak common. We have a table of things that those anim speaking animals might say. And we got the map again with some paths. What are the yellow? So it's paths, right? Okay, the yellow is just paths. Oh, I see. The colors, I guess, are just paths. Uh, I guess they're just differentiated. And then there are trails that are dotted. An underwater tunnel, which is blue dashed. There. Black and white forest. Rabbit wormholes. Quite uniform, the beast perisable. Round kitchen glade. Poppy fields. Poppies. Poppies. Bad feast of ravens. The last feast ever. The white knight. The noon dial. And I guess the John Tenniel. I don't know if these are the John Tenniel illustrations, but I'm guessing these are. Old Al. I mean, I know these are Alice in Wonderland illustrations. I don't know if they're John Tenniel ones, but I guess that they're in the public domain now. So nice use. Nice use. I think those are from Jabberwock, but I can't remember exactly. The tea bog. Some violent tea lights. Well, Will O' Wisps, aka Corpse Lights, meet violent tea lights. Captive Witch, Heir of the Mash, Monhut, the village of Mohorja. Get it? Mahorja? Maybe not. Well, that's a creepy image. Looks like that's paint or blood. Lake of Tears. Then we have some notes on going back. And we have some wonders. What are these? I guess these are magic items. Bag of devouring, bottles, bottled storms, armor of the solar saint. Yep. And then we get the OGL. Well, I, I had to go through it at kind of a, a, a at a pace, which I almost apologize for because there's a lot of good stuff in here. So, I feel like the biggest. It's very well laid out. I think we can argue about the the typography of those headers, but I was able to read them all, so I'll give that for him. It was it didn't quite more bourge me where I could not I had to stare at it, but if you tone those down, I wouldn't mind. And it's an interesting touch because they don't use it anywhere else. So it feels a little bit out of place. All right, so it says, come jabber walk with me, basically. Get your slidey toes going. Come gyre and gimbal in the wave. It's very much a sandboxy kind of thing, but it's got a clock. You've got an enemy with a plan and a timeline. You've got two different realms to hex crawl your way around if you want to, but it's pretty small. Which also means you're going to be able to throw this. If we go back to this main map here, I mean, you can kind of dump this. If you had an existing world, you could pretty much put this anywhere. I don't know if it's it. Did they ever explain what happens to this water? Because it does seem weird to me that the water just starts at Romage. But is it a spring? Or I guess it starts at the lake. I guess, okay, so it's the lake. I guess so presumably it's the lake. And the lake must be, uh, what, I forget what they call a lake where it, it 
it just fills up from groundwater. It doesn't, it's not, it doesn't have a stream that flows into it. There's, there's a name for it. I don't remember what it is. There's a name for it. But that's why it, it's, uh, it's doing that. But it's really, it has a lot going on. Now, the question is, maybe the biggest question is, does it have too much going on? Brian Smith seemed to indicate that maybe for him it did. I'm not so sure, but I haven't run it. I, kinda, I like the way, I mean, I, I think, you know, there's a thing that happens. I, I try to stress it or remember it all the time that reading something's not the same as playing it, playing in it or, or running it. And I think it's, it's highly possible that I've been enchanted by things that read really well, but I haven't had a chance to play them. This, the way it's laid out, reads really well to me where I feel like I can get a lot of the information I need. I think the one thing I didn't find, and that's because I wasn't able to do a super close reading, is, do you, I mean, do the, I don't know, maybe I guess the PC's just, I, you know, it's one of those things that I almost, I would almost, I guess I would almost wonder if it wouldn't be an advantageous to put in, here's kind of what the flow for the players, a version of that would look like. So that they find out this or that, because I'm guessing that the idea is that it, because the, the, the visceral Viscountess is tied to what is happening with the curse and the wolves. That at some point the players are going to get enough information and they're or to start asking the right questions, then have to go meet her. I think that's what we're supposed to. I think that's what we're supposed to do. I, I'm imagining from what that you can't. It would be hard, maybe, or difficult, or impossible even to stop it without engaging with the visceral Viscountess. But I don't know. Um. But there's, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot to like. It is a lot. It is, it is a lot, but I do feel like it's laid out in a pretty easy to use manner, but it could be something that if you're, what did Brian Smith, what did he say? Um, memorable, like uh, evocative and memorizable, short and memorizable. This ain't short and memorizable. But I will say that I think that if you just had old school essentials and you got, and you bought this, I don't think you need anything else. Because you got your, you, you've been given some quick and dirty travel things. You've got your random encounters. You've got your weather. You got like you don't. It's not something where you get this and it's expecting you to have other stuff to make up. Like it is giving you kind of the full package. You have a starting town. Like I said, I think I think like the value of that starting village or hamlet, as they call it, is in that you could potentially keep playing here. Like okay, this is things done. You've still got a whole bunch of stuff going on. You can still be thinking about. Well, how what's going on with the Fey or what's going on with the the Viscountess or what other things are going on? And and I think that's where the value of the the Hamlet comes in. If 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 you're playing this like a one shot or oh hey we're coming in we're coming out then yeah probably that detail is just not useful en enough or not 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 useful. It's just it's more than you need. Right? It's not that you couldn't find use for. It, it's just that it's a lot. Um, Raid LC, you have not missed Wolves of the Coast Part 2. I'm may, I don't know if this week, but probably in a week or so, I'm going to get back into Wolves, the full version of Wolves. Uh, so you haven't missed it. It is coming. Brian Smith says that could be its own genre story you could plan, but not the player's story. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'd, I'd love to hear... I think there's a lot of different angles this could, <laughs> this could go in, especially the player, especially if the party somehow got stuck it really seems like it get interesting if they if they got stuck in the uh, that upside down the the uh, whatever they call it the dark side or the other side and have to kind of make deals with the viscountess or destroy the viscountess which I you know whatever works but it's a lot of fun I mean it, it's 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 ten dollars on itch there are communal copies that get released or community copies that get released periodically as people buy the print on demand versions. So it looks like you can get lucky and swoop in there at the right time and grab it. It's stylish. I think it checks all the boxes. People like art and layout and things. It's very well done. Clear layout. It could be too much. You know, it, your your use may vary. Your what your mileage may vary on how much some of the detail that you're getting in this is going to work for you. And if it works against you, then yeah, this might not be. This, I mean, if you get in kind of an I don't know if analysis paralysis is the right word, where it's just information overload, maybe. Then, yeah, it's something to be wary of here. But it's intriguing. It's got a good, I like the uh, I like the kind of fairy tale vibe it gives and the sort of thing it's got going on. Uh, I dug it. 
I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the read very much. And the link to the itch is in my uh, description, in the description. But before I go, I got something my own. Womp, womp, womp. I'm just going to spend a minute on it. I'm not going to read it right now. But you might have seen I posted this. Uh, I, I was really, uh, I really enjoyed my, my Honey Heist play at PAX East. So I was inspired to throw something together. And I did. It's called Huzzah. It's pay what you want. It's kind of, it's not, it, it's not a re-skinning of Honey Heist. What I think what Honey Heist did for me is it it made me re remember a lot of the fun that I had playing Tune back in the day. Steve Jackson games Tune, um, and just kind of fun and just really just free, just letting stuff happen. Now Honey Heist isn't trying to do what Tune does. In fact, in some ways, it's kind of I'm not saying the anti Tune, but you know the fact is that it it, it posits itself basically. Other than the premise of of these bears being more maybe more sapient and that they are in real life, and then you know criminals, it kind of just puts them in the real world doing the things, which is obviously not what Toon's doing. So I kind of wanted to, sort of inspired by Hunting Heist, wanting to do something in the vein of like a D and D type game that could have that same kind of cartoony, sort of just fun and quick and just kind of get out there and muck about. And this is the system I came up with. Um, it's not particularly groundbreaking, groundbreaking by any means. I really tried to kind of pattern it over a hyper simplified, hyper hyper simplified uh, D twenty because it's you know we're basically playing like cartoony D and D. So I was I didn't feel like I I didn't want to, I didn't want to remake the wheel or do something vastly different. Um, you know you can see here that I just think of the page. There's dungeon master. There's adventures. You do track XP. And, you know, you get goofy magic items. A tune was a big influence on kind of these kind of magic items. I just tried to have fun with some fairy tale slash D&D type stuff. So you got your portable holes, which is, I think is in D&D proper, right? But it's just, a, it's also a cartoony thing. But then I tried to have some fun. So instead of a cube of force, you get a cube of farce. You have a helm of crying instead of a helm of scrying. You have a, a cloak of projection instead of a cloak of protection. Instead of a black cauldron, you can get a bleak cauldron. And uh, the idea here is I don't define any of them. In fact, there's my note at the bottom. What do these items do? I have no idea. The idea is you just get them and just you, fi you figure out in your particular session of the game whatever the heck you can do. I've got a deck of mini things, uh, a bean of stalking. You figure it out. If you want the bean of stalking to grow a big beanstalk, that's great. If you think of bean of stalking and you want to use it to stalk somebody, also great. Like I, It really matters not at all to me. And I try to. I don't know if this will work or not. And I, I, I want to, so I have this concept of XP and I have the concept of alignments in there because I think those are classic kind of D&D &D things. But in this case, with your alignment, if you, uh, there's kind of this concept of, of trying to get the most experience points as you play. And you get experience points by surviving encounters. You get experience points. Um, there's a couple other ways. And I, I think I'm going to add in probably an update that I meant to do before I pushed it and I forgot that I'll probably do really quick. There's a couple more ways to add experience points. But basically, what I thought was clever uh, to me, it, it was clever. I don't know if it will end up being clever or not. Is when um, every encounter, if you survive an encounter, survive, you can't get killed in this game. Again, it's this is from Toon. You get knocked out. And I think I changed it from, originally I was going to get knocked out for a whole encounter, and I changed it to two minutes, which is actually down Toon. I think it was three minutes. So I want to get people, I, you, I want you to get knocked out because, you know, there's something and have like a little bit of a penalty, but it's it over fast and you're, back in the game, which is the tune thing that kind of tune had. So when you're playing the game, if you are on team law, what at the end of every encounter, if the more people who more people who are not knocked out, the more people who survive the encounter, right? They're all up, you're up in the ring, you get experience points for the people who make it. If you're on team chaos, you get more experience for the people who don't make it. So let's say if you had five players if all five survive, if you're on team law, you know, you'll get, you know, four experience points, right? You don't count. Well, you get one, you end up getting five, right? You get one for surviving, you get four for a real survive. If you're on team chaos and everybody survives, you just get one experience point. However, if you were the only one to survive, you would get five experience points. So I kind of set up this, trying to set up this kind of fun thing. But here's the, the, the kicker I put in is that you cannot directly target the other side. You, 
Now, Toon has a lot of like fighting in between, fighting against players, but I thought it'd be a fun kind of twist on it is because you're pres presumably, at least on the surface, working together. That, and I put in caps, and I hope people will catch this. I say that you cannot harm other, you know, adventurers directly. So you can use anything you can find, the environment, other enemies, whatever you can. You can use all this stuff to try to knock out other players, but you can't beat the one directly like fireball and just blow up your party. You got to figure out how to make it work so that you didn't do it directly. That's, and, and I thought that was a lot of fun. So you're kind of working towards a goal, kind of working against each other. Hopefully you could have kind of a cartoony vibe. I kind of tried to imagine, but it's very rules light. I'm not trying to give you a lot of how to play. I'm really hoping that you'll just kind of take it in the direction that I'm trying to offer it. Uh, maybe if I, uh, you know, I would add more text to it. I mean, it is seven pages, but a lot of it is kind of tables. You, I have you roll on some stuff to pick your your species and your class and your attitude. So again, you know, that was kind of my shout out to Honey Honey Heist. We know you have your what kind of bear are you? What kind of what kind of attitude do you have? And what hat are you wearing? So in, in this case, you have a you know your your species, your class, and then you also have an attitude. You know, so you end up with something like, oh, I'm a jaded elf pyromancer, whatever. And and you get kind of different kind of keywords you can use. Again, I don't tell you what those things are. You have fire magic. You can do fire magic however you want to, right? Uh, you you are, you know, you're swift. So you can do, you can be fast. And I'll try to define how fast or whatever, whatever. Uh, yeah, spy versus spy, it's like that. But again, you're not directly, so spy versus spy, like always trapping each other, doing stuff. You you can't directly do that, right? So you have to figure out if I want, if I'm a, on Team Chaos and I'm trying to, and I want to be the last person standing so I get the big experience point bonus. I can't just trap, set a trap for another character because that's me working directly. But what I can try to do is maybe I can get some other NPC to do something or I can set up a chain of events that sort of removes me from the picture, right? So I'm hoping anyway that you'll have this fun kind of thing where everyone's trying to figure out how to sort of affect each other on off angles so that's not oh it wasn't me oh yeah i weakened all those supports you know there's oh what you know there just happened to be a a ceiling cave in over there but i, I didn't blast the pcs maybe i blasted the ceiling and then it fell you know something like that you got to figure out how to do that and of course it's up to i'm not trying to really define that stuff very much because i really want to leave it up to I'm, I'm coming at this as i'm trying to do mostly it's sort of a high trust way so i'm not trying to really define all this stuff hey what is what does indirectly directly mean to you? Then you play that way. I'm not going to try to spell it out with oodles of examples and things. It doesn't matter, right? You if you're in the spirit of it and you're or you're just having fun with it, regardless, then that's what I want. So I thought I would throw that out at the end because I just pushed that up today. I will probably put some little video up about it when I have a moment. Um, but that's that. But uh, house house of under the house under the moon dock was a really good read really well put together oh man people are just putting out amazing looking stuff now uh kind of uh puts me to shame a little bit but i'll i'll you know i'm throwing out these things kind of just word files that i, I keep saying i'm going to come back to these later and lay them out so <laughs> i'll need to do that and all these are really thinking like man people are just doing such great 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 work all right folks that's all i've got have a great rest of your day, night, whenever you end up watching or listening to this. Game on. Talk to you later. Bye now.